And this video, I'll show you how I get the sound, the skins I'm using, mic placement, tuning. I'll even get into how to set some of the processing as far as EQ and compression, when you need it, when you don't, and why. And also keep in mind when you're listening back to this on YouTube that the sound you're hearing is compressed. It's downsized from the the raw file, the raw video file, down to a Windows media format. And I think Windows or uh, YouTube also compresses it further on top of that. So if you want to hear the actual file, the sound that you get from a setup like this, feel free to contact me through Mike's Lessons profile, Facebook or email, whatever you have. Okay, the first part of recording that I'll get into is the kick drum because I believe it's the most difficult to reproduce. There's a lot happening with mic selection that most people overlook. So I'll go over the basics of what to look for. The two most important things I believe are the polar pattern and the frequency response. And again, I guess you can talk about the, the type of microphone, dynamic condenser, ribbon, that sort of thing. And That'll help you determine what to purchase, and I'll also go over how I place the microphone and what effects moving the microphone will have with your sound. The kick drum microphone I'm using is the CAD KM212. It's a dynamic microphone, and the pickup pattern is cardioid, which means it's going to pick up fairly well from straight on, front on axis, and fairly well from the sides off axis. There's a little bit of pickup at the back of the microphone but not much so you'll get quite a bit of sound coming from the front and still hear the ambience within the kick drum itself. It'll help give it a, a little more punch and, and a full sound to it. The further away from the batter, the front of the drum that you put the kick drum microphone, the lower and muddier the sound you'll receive and that's because you're getting away from the, the high frequency slap of the skin and you're getting into the port area of the the resonant skin where all the sound comes out and you're just getting a lot of air, a lot of low end uh, response. So here are the sound clips, check out the difference and keep in mind when you're placing your kick drum microphone you'll spend literally hours trying to figure out the best placement, angle, height, distance from the skin, there's so much to consider. So don't worry too much about the cardioid or polar pattern right now. I can show you that later a little, a little more in detail. But here goes the placement of what I'm using. The head of the microphone is about six inches from, from the skin, from the batter. It's pretty much centered on the skin as well. As far as the settings for my kick drum, I'm using the stock pearl head that came with the drum set. It's a 22 by 20 kick drum and the skin is literally placed on the rim. I bottomed out all the lugs finger tight and I went about a quarter turn on each lug. So it's very loose on the front on the batter head. I have a small blanket rolled up along the bottom. That's just to touch either head so it doesn't ring out too much and also allows a lot of the shell to be exposed. The resident head is quite a bit tighter. I would say half to three quarters of a turn on each lug and that really helps bring out the full sound in the room. And you'll also notice there is a hole cut out for the microphone and that allows me to get the microphone inside the kick drum. I tend to get a much better sound with that I think that's the technique used in most live and studio recordings, especially for rock music. Now the snare drum microphone is a CAD SN210. It's a super cardioid pattern. It's a dynamic microphone. And its frequency response is quite flat from about 150 hertz up to maybe 1500. And then there's some boost up 
around 5,000 to 10,000 kilohertz, and then it drops off. The polar pattern is what's called a supercardioid, and that gives you rejection from the back of the microphone, but more sensitivity direct on axis. So you will get a lot of bleed from, let's say, your hi-hat or kick drum or toms that are adjacent to the snare. And I've also compared this with a Shure SM57. You'll notice that the sound is, is quite reasonable compared to the Shure. And the CAD snare drum mic is probably half the cost. So take your pick. They sound pretty close and I'm quite impressed with, uh, with the CAD microphone. So here are the sound files. And for tom miking, I'm using the CAD TM211. It's a cardioid pattern. It's a dynamic microphone. And the frequency response is quite uneven for this guy. It tends to favor the high frequencies, especially around 500 to 10,000 kilohertz. It's really boosted up in that end. A lot of top end frequency. And this polar pattern, as I said, is a cardioid. It picks up directly in front. You can pick up from the side. There's not too much pickup from the back end. So the rejection is pretty good. I also used an AKG C535 EB that um, I compared it with. And the AKG is a condenser microphone. I don't have the uh, frequency response for the AKG but it's also a cardioid. It has different settings. I used a flat response for this. Actually, all the microphones you're, you're hearing are, are flat EQ. Everything's going in basically from the microphone, a mic cord, into the A to D converter, right to the computer. So everything's flat. Nothing is enhanced here at all, except maybe for some gain uh, uh, boost just to get the sound up a little bit. Other than that, what you're hearing is a flat EQ response. So here are the two sound files. The first one is the CAD TM211, and the second one you'll hear is the AKG C535. And for cymbals and overheads, I'm using the CAD CM217. It's a cardioid pattern. And this one is a condenser type microphone. The frequency response is quite flat from, I would say, 50 hertz all the way up to 10 kilohertz. And it also picks up up until the 14, 15 kilohertz for the bright sound of the cymbals. Basically, when you're positioning the overheads, you want to make sure they're centered over the snare. You also want to make sure they are equal height above the snare. Because when you're doing a left and right stereo mix, if the snare sound reaches one microphone later than the other, you're going to get a weird stereo effect through your speakers. So make sure you use a tape measure, whatever you need to do. It's pretty critical. You might not hear it with a few centimeters or, you know, half an inch of difference. But if you start getting some weird distances from each microphone, you're going to hear that through your stereo playback. If you can get a matched set of microphones for the overheads, that's even better. That basically means they're going to have the same frequency response, the same gain, and that'll give you a better stereo image.